James Giordano here today from Georgetown University. He is a professor, I have to read this because it's a lot. Um, he's a professor in the development of neurobiology and biochemistry. He's a chief of neuroethics studies program and the co-director of the O'Neill Pellegrino program in brain science and the global health law and the policy at Georgetown University. Um, he served on the joint s staff of the Pentagon um, and in this uh, area he heads up the EU Human Brain Project. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, he's tasked with his, his work is dedicated to the studying and defining of current and political dual use capabilities in neuroscience and neurotechnology. It's an extremely in-depth discussion. Um, I encourage you guys to ask, ask questions, questions at the end. Um, his area is, uh, his expertise is in brain science and can be developed and engaged in military applications, warfare applications, um, bioweapons, um, both by state and non-state actors. So I'm going to head it over to Jim. Oh, great, thank you. I think it's really a pleasure to be here. It's uh, my second or third time being out at Livermore. I've been working for a while with, with Zach, and that's been a real pleasure. And of course, my ongoing work with, with Paris and company. As Paris mentioned, uh, one of the things that I do is I do brain science. And I've worked in the area of translational brain science, which is bringing brain science from the research bench to the bedside for about the past 32 years. So I've been doing this for a while. Brain science, as you may know, has also had a fairly rapid development and trajectory of its capabilities moving from fairly simple approaches to studying the brain to far more complicated approaches that I'll talk to you about today. But like with so many other areas of science and technology, the capability that is conferred by the science, that is the knowledge, and its techniques and its technology, therefore its tools, giving us implements, to affect in some way a biological system renders it relatively powerful to do a whole host of things. Now, as Paris mentioned, of course, I also work as the chief of an ethics center at Georgetown. I'm working within the Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics. And what I do is an area called neuroethics, a relatively new field, but not per se. The idea is that the title of neuroethics has only been around since about 2002 in formal use. But the idea of understanding the ethics, legal, and social issues, and regulatory issues that arise from many science and technology are quite old. What makes neuroethics a bit more interesting and perhaps unique is that the thing that we use as the focus of our study, the brain and those techniques and technologies that go into studying the brain and in some ways affecting the brain, remain relatively unknown to us. I, I don't care how you twist this. There's really none of us in this room, and I've been a brain scientist for over three decades, who could tell you how the great stuff, like cognition, emotion, and even behavior, arise in and from that gray stuff of those squirting, squirting cells that exist in your head. We don't know that. But we're going to be Aristotelian for a moment and sort of wax philosophically. What I could tell, oh, you enjoyed it. That's good. So I always look for the philosopher in the car who gets the Aristotelian gig. The issue is very simple. We don't understand what's called the efficient cause of what the brain does. We know how it works as a basic biological system. We might even speculate and very realistically, why it's important to a biological system. But do we know how the brain makes, quote, mind? No, we don't. Yet, that doesn't stop us, because there's something called the mechanistic paradox, which is although we need to understand the mechanism of how and why something works, we also fall victim to the fact that very often we use what's called satisficing information. In other words, good enough for government work, and we'll just proceed on smartly. Moreover, what that also does is raises the intersection of a host of unknowns. If we don't know how the thing that we're affecting works, well, the beauty of it is the tools that we develop help us to understand that. But then we have to revise what we think are the key issues that come from our tool use on that thing. This is not what's called reductio ad absurdum. This is not reductive thinking. It's real. That said, let me take you on a little trip in time to Bain Sciences, what they really do. Let me move this down here, because I'm so short you can't see me over the bottle of water. <laughs> so, this slide, I think, very nicely demonstrates for you a relative 100-year history of the brain sciences, going back to an anatomical diagram that was pioneered right after the advent of anesthesia in the middle of the 1800s to be able to allow direct access to the living brain neurosurgically. Now, what that allowed us to do is to manipulate the structure of the brain and, as a consequence of that, see what artifacts occurred with regard to individual's thought, emotionality, and behaviors. Of course, we all know the prototypic example being Phineas Gage, the railroad worker who got a tamping iron through his frontal lobes. 
and as a consequence of that, survived, but as the adage says, Phineas was Phineas no more. <laughs> so the issue here is that there's something ticking away within your cranium that makes you, you. That renders the brain science as exceedingly important, not any more perhaps in certain ways than other areas of the biomedical sciences, but in ways that are both practical and philosophical. In other words, if I'm able to in some way assess and affect this thing that is in at least some way demonstrably and perhaps to a large extent responsible for making you, you, your persona, your thoughts, your hopes, your dreams, well, look at the power that that can yield. We like to talk about influencing hearts and minds, but this is a question of influencing brains to influence hearts to then influence minds. Continue to look at the slide, because what you see is the interesting dance that essentially technology has allowed the brain sciences to advance with. We've gone from these rather rudimentary examples of utilizing these techniques of surgery during the beginning of the last century, the 1900s, to being able to utilize ever more sophisticated anatomical and molecular probes to understand the brain at a variety of ever more nuanced and granular levels, and ultimately to not even have to intervene with the actual structure of the brain, but to be able to assess the brain in real time, utilizing convergent forms of neuroimaging coupled to a host of neuroelectrophysiological techniques. It's been very, very important. Because what this allows us to do is essentially something akin to this, both literally and metaphorically, which is to essentially put the brain at our fingertips. This is my brain. I take it out nightly and floss it with my haircut. It makes it rather easy. <laughs> but there is something I want you to also understand about this. If you were to do exactly as I'm doing here in this slide, which would be to put your brain in front of you, first of all, the mere size of it, I think, is somewhat interesting to people. We tend to think it's a lot larger. It's not. It fits in the palm of your hands. But now let's wax a little more philosophical but very practical with that same analogy. If this is something that fits in the palm of your hand, every hope, every dream, every thought, every aspiration, everything you love, everything you hate fits in that organ. And if I really wanted to wax philosophical, everything that humanity has ever done and will be is a consequence of that organ's function. Once again, we're talking about power. But let me tell you a little neuroanatomical and neuroscientific adage. We have a saying in the brain sciences, see one brain, see one brain, which means that despite the fact that if I pulled my brain out of my head and his brain out of her, his and her brain out of hers, it would basically look like that with regard to its gross architecture. The devils and deities lie in the details. Our brains develop as a consequence of their embodiment in me and you, and as a consequence of the environments we work in, which means that what the brain sciences are helping to do is to figure out both what brains have in common and what brains have in difference. Now, the beauty of that is, through the iterative use of big data, what we're able to do is to create large-scale patterns, maps, atlases of not only individual brains, but groups of brains, and use these things comparatively and normatively. The more we know, the bolder we go. Puts the brain at our fingertips. But what you want to see is that the brain sciences have, in fact, created a tremendous amount of momentum and potential. And that is the momentum to be able to assess, access, and effect. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. What it really does is it creates an opportunity to affect the way humans think, feel, and behave on a variety of levels. And those levels don't only extend within the individual organism. In other words, being able to affect thought, emotion, behavior with regard to ranging all the way from the synaptic to our social interactions individually. But it also allows us to then exert certain levels of intellectual assessment, knowledge acquisition, and control about human relations on the individual, to cohort, to group, to community, to local, regional, even global scale. And obviously, we can, in fact, use that information and arguably the capacity to be able to not just use the information, but to actually physically affect the brain through these techniques and tools in ways that are important to, meaningful for, and highly leverageable within national security, intelligence, and defense agenda. This is no different than other forms of science and technology. Arguably, one could say that the individual with the most sophisticated science and technology has always looked to bring those into those agendas to defend kin and kith, to be able to advance an ideology, to be able to defend those things we hold dear. History teaches us that. The latest and greatest tools are very often incorporated into these large-scale agenda, particularly by mechanized and technological countries. We've seen this historically 
uh, throughout the ages, this being no different. So the idea that what we're able to say is that the leverageability of the brain sciences extends from the synaptic to the social, and from the individual to the global, is not just a lot of fancy rhetoric. It is, in fact, real and realizable. Moreover, in utilizing the brain sciences in these ways, I think it becomes important to understand a formal definition of a term that I will use repeatedly throughout this lecture. This term, a weapon. As directly cited from the Oxford English Dictionary, there are two interactive and I think important definitions of a weapon you need to understand. The first is as a means of contending against another. Uh, we hear this colloquially, you know, someone who has a great sense of humor, so, oh, their sense of humor is a real weapon. In other words, they can use it well to interact with others positively and in some cases derisively. Uh, the old sort of film noir movies where it showed the sultry woman sitting in the, blonde, in the bar and she'd show some leg and be like, those gams are a weapon. Those kind of things. Yeah, it's a means of contending against another. For those of you who are far younger than I, gams is a slang for legs. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a derogative or denigrative way. It is a way of contending against another. I can use humor as a weapon to disarm someone. I can use affability as a weapon to make what may have been a potential foe or, or hostile, my friend. But I think the way that we use the word weapon more colloquially is the one that comes to mind and should not be ignored in this context, which is this, something that can be used to injure, defeat, and or destroy another, a potential enemy. Put them both together, you have this wonderful 25 buck definition, and I usually impugn anyone who reads off a PowerPoint slide, but I just want to reinforce the definition. Something that mitigates aggression and fosters thoughts and feelings of affiliation or passivity. Oh, in other words, if I make my enemy my friend, not my enemy any longer, that's still weaponizable, and or something that incurs burdens of morbidity and or mortality. The idea of this is something not only used to influence and deter, but actually to, in some way, mitigate or prevent an individual from exercising those actions towards me and mine. If we look at weapons and we were to trace these historically, I think Ruddington provides a very, very good overview of the history of weapons. There are a number of different books that could provide this for you. Everything from somebody picking up a rock and using it a la 2001, a space odyssey, all the way up to the contemporary use of very, very sophisticated forms in S&T. What we see is as the momentum of S&T increases, the weaponizability of that science and technology in a variety of realms also increases. It used to be that I need to be exceedingly close to someone to now influence them with a weapon. And now what we see is we create both distal potential as well as much more capable potential to affect them in a variety of different ways, ranging from the sublime all the way up to the severe. So we know this to exist. There are two types of weapons those that are called soft weapons, and those that are called hard weapons. If we now take a look at the brain sciences as weaponizable, a real word, by the way, we can see that, in fact, the brain sciences are weaponizable across both dimensions, soft weaponizability and hard weaponizability. In the former sense, we're seeing that the neurosciences can be used to gain economic leverage not least of which is because neuroscience and technology commands and captures 175 billion, with a B, dollar annual market space. There's a tremendous amount of global economic leverage that can be occurred and affected, but can also be used for somewhat softer applications in the national security space, inclusive of intelligence purposes and the use of neuro and cognitive sciences to develop insights to and techniques for psychological operations and information systems, what is referred to in military parlance as PSYOPs and MISO. If we now transition that into more hard forms of weaponizability, these are the areas where we're actually looking to exert physical, not just cognitive influence and or deterrence. These are your more classical forms of weaponization where you actually see things like guns, bullets, bombs, etc. But now, when confined to the biological space, we see chemicals such as drugs and other chemical agents, biological such as the use of various microbes with bacteria and viruses and toxins, and increasingly devices, which up until quite recently were not even considered to be in the weaponizable space, and only very recently with regard to the last review conference of the International Biological Toxins and Weapons Convention last December, did the Australia group raise the possibility that certain devices, namely neurotechnology and hybrid cyborg type devices, which we'll talk about, should be considered within the larger scale of what might be a potential biological. So what we're seeing is we need to cast a broader net as we increase broader and ever more sophisticated capabilities. Still with me? Okay. 
In fact, what we're doing here is just this. We're targeting the brain. And we're targeting the brain on a variety of levels. Now, like any good target, what I have to be able to do is I need to put the pipper on point. In other words, I need to put this gun sight, so to speak, where I want it to be. Otherwise, what I'm doing is I'm just hosing a target indiscriminately. That's not what I look to do. I don't want buckshot. I want sharp shot. So the first thing that I need to do, as anyone will tell you, is I have to recon my target area quite well so as to be able to acquire viable targets and also to avoid collateral damage. The assessment neurotechnologies do a very good job in doing that with increasing sophistication. They're not used individually. They're used in a way that's called co-registered. I can use forms of neuroimaging, and these are diverse. They run the gamut from the older forms, such as things like computerized tomography and single photon emission tomography to the much newer forms that utilize a highly specific electromagnetic pulse signal, not only to be able to image certain brain areas, but also to image tracts, uh, communicating networks and nodes within the brain in a directional way in, in rather rapid time. I can utilize neurophysiological recordings, such as electroencephalography, and I've dialed in the specificity of that as well through the use of quantitative techniques. I can also look at neurogenomics and neurogenetics, taking a look at genetic profiles of individuals and groups to be able to determine what genes may be, in fact, coding for certain structures and functions of the brain. I can utilize proteomics and other forms of biomarkers, and I can utilize neurocyber informatics. In other words, I can harness all of these forms of assessments to a big data approach that allow me to make both comparatives and normative indices not only within an individual, but between individuals, not only between individuals, but within and between groups on a variety of scales. So the idea of assessment technology, in many ways, combines each and all of these, and the combinatory power of that is facilitated and fortified through the use of big data. We've written comprehensively about the use of big data as a force multiplier in neuroscience and neuroweaponology, and if you're interested, I'd be happy to provide that to you. But the idea here is like so many other forms, of recon and evaluation and assessment, we as humans tend not to turn rocks over just to look what's underside. We turn rocks over so we can use what's under there. The brain is no different. If what I'm doing is I'm trying to put a pipper on target and make sure it's square on point, I want to do something with that. This is not just a let's go see mission. This is a let's go see so that ultimately we can translate this into some viable effect, either of the knowledge or to actually target these things through the use of some technique or technology. Now what we're looking at is the interventional techniques. Do not ignore cyber, because power comes from knowledge and information. And if I understand how a brain works and how neurocognitive mechanisms are operative and the various impressions we then gain in our thoughts, emotions that may ultimately feed into behaviors, I can manipulate the type of information and its delivery so as to be able to influence brain state. This is part of the incentive and underlying rationale and methods that were employed in a DARPA program called Narrative Networks that was led by a colleague of mine, Dr. William Kaysbeer. Exactly at doing that, the more we know about the way a brain works, the more we can utilize said information to develop key narratives of psychological and meso operations that are then viable to be able to then be used to influence individual and group brains. We've done this for a long time. This is also referred to, incidentally, as neuromarketing. And ordinarily, I kind of just kind of shy away from that neuro prefix because people tend to use it literally nonsensically. And in fact, a quick homework assignment for those of you who are students in the room, I never lose my professorial demeanor. For those of you who are students in the room, after the lecture today, sometime maybe over the week or weekend, you just go to a magazine store, a bookstore, and pull out a few magazines. They don't even have to be science magazines. They can be like fitness magazines, wine spectator, whiskey advocate. My God, I sound like an alcoholic. Whiskey advocate. <laughs> shape, vanity fair, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that there's going to be some discussion there with a picture of a neural image that says, this is your brain fill in the blank, drinking beer. This is your brain in love. This is your brain after a breakup. We like the, to use the brain sciences to sort of import this type of information. And moreover, the idea that we're able to utilize this in a way to understand how brains work to influence various marketing stratagems is becoming ever more the norm. I have a colleague of mine who makes big six figures working for a marketing firm to be able to intuit these types of studies, bringing people into a scanner and seeing what they respond to and then developing verbiage and image to be able to do just that. That narrative extends beyond the commercial space. It also extends into the defense space. 
and I refer you to a group of reports that we've been putting out over the past few years to the Strategic Multilayer Assessment Group that's headed by a fellow named Doc Kabayan at the Pentagon that looks exactly at that, the neurocognitive dynamics of deterrence. This is still somewhat soft. We still tend to rely more and more on the older forms of get in there and do the job. And now what we're looking at basically are things like drugs, bugs, toxins, and devices. One more time, drugs, bugs, toxins, and devices. Each and all of these being capabilized by ever more sophisticated, ever more advanced, and iteratively more capable, <coughs> doable forms of neuroscience and technology. We'll talk about each of these in some detail. But what we're able to do with these is not only develop better drugs, but more specific drugs. I had the opportunity and the pleasure to interact with some from the research groups here this morning who are working in the area of nanopharmacology. The idea of harnessing nanoscience to be able to make the drugs more penetrable, more accessible, and more selective in their capability to do just this. Target key brain sites and networks that have shown to be operative and functional in certain forms of our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. Moreover, to be able to develop new forms of biologicals, not necessarily that are lethal, but that are morbid. And one of the more successful approaches to doing this is through utilizations of genetic modification of these microbes so as to take those microbes that were relatively benign and make them somewhat more morbid in their profile, make them more virulent, or to allow them to be more capable over a longer period of time so that they can be used against various individuals and populations with a greater level of efficiency. We can also develop new forms of neurotoxins, and since neurotoxins for the most part are peptides, they degrade fairly rapidly. But here, too, forms of genetic modification, forms of nanomicellar encapsulation and delivery can allow these to become newly available and newly more potent and viable for the use in the weapon space. And once again, we're now exhibiting a new horizon of possibility, which is the neurotechnological device space. Each and all of these, what I should let you understand, is engaged by this particular process, which is a real term, integrative scientific convergence. It is a term that a colleague of mine, formerly at the State Department, named Dr. Ashok Vishasta, has been working very, very closely to advance and understand. And it's essentially represented by this neat little cartoon. It's a de-siloing of the capability space. It's also a de-siloing of the opportunity space, both for problems and problem resolution and problem generation yet again. In the past, when I grew up in science, as many of you have grown up in science doing, for those of, who are sort of more of my generation, you recognize you had fairly discrete silos of disciplinary operation. Those of us in chemistry, who talked to those of us in biology, and there was some crosstalk, cross-fertilization, but very often they occurred at the top and the bottom of the silo. Things that occurred within the silo occurred within the silo. Sort of like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens in your department stays in your department. More and more, however, we're moving towards this conjoinment model that de-silos the operation and opportunity space and allows for a much more convergent engagement of what the brain sciences can do. And in fact, for those of you working in the brain sciences, you recognize that there's a relatively sort of fluid dynamic that occurs between physics and chemistry, chemistry and biology, biology and behavioral science, and undergirding and perhaps overseeing all of these are both engineering models and computational models. These have been capabilized by this. So it allows us to conjoin cyber science and tech, the anthro and social sciences, natural sciences, biotechnology, and nanoscience and technology in a large integrative model that increases the viability, validity, and ultimately perhaps value of what the brain sciences can achieve in a fairly short period of time. And in national security intelligence and defense agendas more and more, this type of convergent approach is being harnessed upon assessment, access, and targeting of neurological structure and function so as to be able to get a better insight to and influence of individuals and groups on a whole host of levels. One of the things that makes this work, as I alluded to earlier, is the use of large-scale data banking and data utilization, what's referred to as big data. Not to belabor the point to excess or in extremis, understand it is used as a force multiplier. In other words, it takes the forces that are there and it multiplies both their capability and ultimately their value and utility as a consequence of being able to utilize large volume data banks, which then are able to engage, assimilate, synthesize, and pull down in real time individual cohort and populational data tiers, and in so doing, allow multiple tier integration, multimodal, multi-level, 
and then also allow real-time access requirements that can be utilized in practice. In other words, we can use these large-scale data integrators to be able to pull information about him and her and him in a comparative way, in a normative way, and also in a way that allows us to then develop various tools to be able to understand how better to access him and her and him and all of, as you can tell from my New York accent, use. Now, this has to be scalable in many cases. Check, it is. It has to be customizable. We're still working on that one. It has to be accessible, clearly, because multiple user groups, shareholders and stakeholders, have to get to it. And it has to be shareable. There are some issues that go along with that. And for those of you working in the neuroengineering space, this has been a long-standing issue, I would say in some cases, problem, with regard to developing the right types of big data tools and techniques, specifically for large-scale integrative projects, such as those that are being funded by DARPA, subnets, systems-based neurotechnology for emerging therapies, RAM, restoring active memory, haptics, et cetera, multi, multi, multi levels of different types of data coming from different types of engineering and science that have to be pulled together to make a cogent picture. But we're doing that. We're moving in those directions. And in some cases, you also want to anonymize or de-anonymize these data. And there are some security issues that you would imagine go along with that. But the other issue that goes along with this is that at least on the research to translation side of the house, you see these increasing needs for what we call security. And I mean real security. You want these things to be secure in terms of their use because I'm providing a lot of information about the you-ness of you. Perhaps your lifelong history, your medical records, things about your brain, what they infer. And the nature of these systems is that you have to stack different types of data platforms and use platforms. And although I am not particularly a cyber technology mogul, my colleagues who are tell me that if something is stackable, it's hackable. I tell you from my own experience, what I am is a longtime judo player and wrestler. And I know if you want to knock somebody down, even the biggest guy goes down at their weak points, and that's their joints. And this is no different. And so the issue here is, yes, we need this tool. We're developing this tool. We see the viability and value of this tool. But we also recognize the vulnerability of this tool, as do others. Key point. Which means that as we're beginning to look at the potential weaponization, weaponizability of neuroscience, we also have to recognize the vulnerability of the tools we're developing to make it work. Those are not only our own vulnerabilities, but those are the vulnerabilities of those other groups that may be engaged in this. But now let's move a little bit more into the more direct applications of viable neuroscience and technology with regard to battlescape use, battlescape applications. I've given lectures over the past couple of years and written chapters that have directly attributed the brain as the next battlescape, and I truly believe that, as do a number of my other colleagues. I'm not alone in that belief. The idea of developing a much more punctate, and much more clear definition of what dual use constitutes and recognizing that this is, in fact, a very usable domain of the brain sciences, I think is a reality we must face. So much so that let me give you a little bit of history as an aside, not, not to bore you. In 2008, a convening group of the National Academies of Science created a special commission, a task force, to take a look at the viable military use of the brain sciences. In 2008, they said, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on there, but it ain't ready for prime time yet, 2008. In the interim, there was an ongoing study being conducted in Europe by the Nuffield Council of Bioethics that devoted a specific chapter to the weaponizability and dual use potential of brain sciences and said, you know, we're getting very close. And they estimated that within about a year or two, this would in fact be translatable and ready for prime time. In the United States, the same convening power, panel of the uh, National Academies <coughs> reconvened and in 2014 wrote a second report that said, yes, indeed, the brain sciences have matured to a point not only where they are ready for prime time national security, intelligence, and defense applications, but are currently being investigated and in some cases are being used in such endeavors, not only domestically, but worldwide. 2008 to 2014, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. It reflected the transitional pace of progress in the brain sciences, which has gone from between 15 and 20 years down to a translational space of about 60 to 72 calendar months. In five-year windows of opportunity, the brain sciences were able to make ardent strides, and as a consequence of that, are now moving rapidly for their consideration into this operationalizable space, evermore. What I caution against very strongly is two things. Number one, crying wolf. And number two, what we call chicken little phenomenon. The first is wolf, 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 and there's no wolf there. 
So finally, when there is a wolf there, we're caught with our knickers down around our knees. And the second is the chicken little phenomenon. The sky is falling, the sky is falling. That's exaggerative claims. That does nobody any good, and it wastes resources. This is not crying wolf, and this is not chicken little. There's a wolf there. And although it may not be that the sky is falling yet, folks, it looks like rain. Bring an umbrella. That said, what's going to rain down? This. Various uses of neuroscience and technology in intelligence, security, and defense operations. So for example, if we take a look at the intelligence and surveillance space, our group has been very focused upon the capability of something called neurint, neurocognitive intelligence, which really represents not only assessing various neuropsychological factors that are operative in narratives of individual and group activities and the cognitions that underscore them, but also harnessing intelligence operators to brain-machine interfacing systems so as to allow an increased capability through reciprocal dynamic robotics, whereby the system is doing certain things quite well, the human operator is doing things quite well, and they reciprocally learn from each other. Demonstrated shifts in performance curves to the left, in other words, improvement in capability, has been demonstrated through some of these techniques. And the use of large-scale databasing that's able to present and engender certain patterns of salience to pull signal from noise has been very helpful in this. Is this a work in progress? Yes, absolutely. Is it in progress? Very absolutely. Moreover, we can utilize various types of brain assessment and access approaches for forms of biotracking getting what's called neurological signatures or brain signatures on key individuals that then may be representative of whole groups. This speeds back to what we discussed earlier, the neural narratives. If I understand how his brain works and how her brain works, and I'm able to do that on a broad enough scale, I can develop patterns, and as a result, I may be able to use that in ways that inform my intelligence. It synergizes and force, multi force multiplies my human intelligence, human, my signal intelligence, SIGINT, and my communications intelligence, COMINT. Neurint, coupled with assessment and access, gives me said capabilities. But I can also begin to utilize this for intelligence acquisition in different ways. I can, for example, utilize neuropharmacologics in various forms of brain stimulation to be able to extract information from key intelligence targets in ways that are far less deleterious and or harmful to said targets, and as a result, uphold a higher, if you will, moral conduct in the face of various forms of intelligence operations. Now that I've said that, I should tell you that this is not without argument, because there are those that think, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The last sanctified space is that of my consciousness, and you're using this stuff to invade that? You're right. There's an ethical argument there. Is this more or less harmful than other means of information extraction? Well, I mean, clearly, I think this is not only a debatable point, but an importantly debatable point, which forces us to essentially set parameters and limits and ask not only can we use this, the answer is yes, should we use this? And if the answer there appears to be yes, then the far more granular, specific, and ever more important question is really how, when, under what circumstances? I'll keep you poised in excitement and anticipation on the ends of your seat for the answer to that, which comes later in this lecture. For those of you watching on video, stand by. So what we understand is, is this possible? Yes, it is. In fact, it came up in our discussions this morning. Might it be possible to utilize these techniques and technologies for information acquisition, particularly in those ways that are going to be far more efficient without incurring, quote, burdens and harms on those who are interrogating? And what are the scenarios into which they could be used? Again, the short answer to the question is yes. The long answer to the question is how, when, why? Mm, these are percolating, and certainly I don't think there's a necessarily definitive answer, although there seems to be at least an ethical posture that may be useful in trying to adjudicate the approach. Moreover, we can also utilize something called Titan, which is tiered integrative tracking and access networks that utilize biologically implantable chips to then track key individuals in a variety of circumstances and then yoke these to known information about the way brains work to create narratives and behaviors. And essentially what this does is this adds to what's called human terrain teaming. This feeds back to an older idea called naked man approaching. In other words, I don't need to identify you by your uniform, by your clothes, but perhaps by certain anthropometric characteristics, and in this case, biological signatures. So the idea of indwelling biosensors that are able to then upload remotely Tele, tele, telemetrized, see this is what happens when the coffee wears up, 
telemetrized information is quite real. Those of you working in the area of biosensors, RFIDs, understand the potential power here. This is a key area for dual use because these types of sensors are being developed for populational monitoring of key biological variables that can be then uptaken into health inf information databases. The same type of thing can be used for other forms of information, not least of which is tracking and identification. The idea to then be able to take a key individual set of biological metrics and immediately in real time pull them into a large scale data analytic to say this is who this person is and this is where this person's been and this is who this person's been interacting with could be very, very useful. It also obviously opens the specter. It clearly opens a Pandora's box of potential neuroethical, legal, and social issues. Once again, it refers to the context of use and how we define what is good, not only what is right and capable. We can also utilize neuroscience and technology to augment the capability of potential war fighters, not just intelligence operators. This sort of gets into some of the discourse that had been bantered around previously in the field with regard to, quote, super soldiers, and what we're able to do with regard to capabilizing functions of the brain to then increase our cognition, our emotions, and our behaviors in a variety of war fighting type tasks. Can you do this? Well, this is the area of neuroenablement. Yes, of course you can, within certain parameters. And like so many other things, it's less than ideal and less than complete. But can we target key neurological substrates change the function of those substrates and in so doing approach various trajectories of improving individuals' cognitive skills on key tasks, emotional capabilities in the key circumstances, and behaviors and actions in key performance parameters? Yes, we can. Are there limits? Are there constraints? Yes, absolutely. How can we do this? Well, I think one of the easiest ways, although not necessarily the most effective, is through the use of advanced neuropharmacological agents. And there are a host of them. Certainly, we hear a lot of the discourse about performance-enhancing drugs, not only in terms of the military, but for a variety of, of other uses, inclusive the civilian side of the house where people are looking to take a variety of drugs, stimulants, eugeroics, uh, vigilance, uh, anti-sedative drugs, to be able to then increase their capability to study, to function, to be better at work, cognitive enhancers. Uh, could these be used within military and security intelligence frameworks? Yes, absolutely we could. Could we also use computational brain-machine interfacing? Without a doubt. Could we use closed and open-loop brain stimulation approaches, not necessarily through use of indwelling devices, such as implants, but also perhaps through the use of non-invasive brain stimulation, such as transcranial magnetic and electrical stimulation? The answer appears to be yes. The short answer, the long answer, is that it is exceedingly context-dependent, it's based upon brain state, based upon task, and we have to define what exact parameters of performance we're looking to affect and what changing the function of nerve and brain does to change the relative outcomes with regard to these performances. But that doesn't mean we can't do it. The question is, should we and how? The same is true with regard to neurosensory augmentation. Here I'll speak very specifically to some of the programs you have ongoing. There have been some bioengineering programs here at this laboratory that has looked at the capability to increase visual acumen, if not restore sight, to individuals who've lost their sight. Increased capability to create second and third generation cochlear and auditory implants. These are not limited to the usual range of the human sensorium, but can, in fact, be used to get increased focus, what's sometimes referred to as eagle eye, or something referred to as bat's ear. So the ability to then extend the sensorium and modify human capability outside what falls within the Gaussian distribution of what is human clearly is capable here and may be paired to other forms of neurological intervention to create open and closed loop brain systems to really expand not only the capacity of the human system within its functional range, but to go beyond that and now have something called exceptional modification. No sci-fi here, folks, only facts. Then we get into the real form of a weapon. When we're talking about a real form of a weapon, remember, this is a means of contending against another in each and all of these dimensions. Assess and predict their escalations to violence so that we may be able to intervene, perhaps mitigate those. Mitigate said aggression directly or indirectly. Incur certain burdens of morbidity that makes them less likely to engage in combative or violent activity and in some cases, induce mortality. These are all viable operational definitions of a weapon, and can neuroscience and technology be employed for these? Each and all. 
One of the areas where we're looking to refine the capabilities of neuroscience and technology is something referred to as non-lethal or less lethal weapons. And while one might think that the ethical argument strongly supports these direction, here too, there is in fact a strong discourse that pushes back against any potential military warfare applications of the brain sciences that I think you need to understand. The reason I bring that up is that this can do two things. Number one, it creates a posture where the neurosciences cannot and should not ever be used for these types of operations. Please understand, my feeling on that is, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? If we could in fact look ourselves in our eye as humanity and say we shall never employ science and technology for those means that may be destructive against others, irrespective of whether or not those individuals are aligned with our ideology and our beliefs. Yes, that would be. The reality of the situation poses itself as something quite differently, however. And the problem we need to face is that certain prohibitions, if not frank proscriptions against using brain science in these potential ways, even defensively, may create an opportunistic window for others to be able to then pursue these approaches more vigilantly and more aggressively. It's a balancing act, folks. I'm not going to necessarily tell you how to resolve it because I don't know, and it becomes difficult. There are certain things we can do on the research side of the house to dial back who does the research, what type of research is done, and what it's used for. But this is a cat that's already out of the bag, and as I hope to demonstrate to you in a moment, this is being conducted on an international scale, and so it may be a little late to start thinking about we're never going to use it like this and what happens if we do or we don't. What types of kind of neuroweapons can we engage and develop? Well, I provide them for you. I don't want to go down into specific granularities of what each one of them do because I don't want to give you bad dreams, and you're not going to blame me if you wake up in a cold sweat screaming in the middle of the night. But this is what we can do with these things. Again, let's think here about drugs and bugs. If we're looking at drugs, we're looking at what we call in-close pharmaceuticals. These are not weapons of mass destruction. These are weapons of mass disruption. What they can be used to do is create particular yet highly selective effects in individuals so that they can be delivered at very, very low doses, yet deliver a high amplification effect that's called a hormetic potential to be able to alter cognitions, emotions, and behaviors. How do you do that? Well, you can work on key operatives. In other words, this individual who's sitting before me may be a diplomat. They are now coming to interact with me. They may have a posture that does not necessarily align with mine. Can I alter their cognition? Can I alter their affiliation? Can I alter their emotionality? And in such a way, might I be able to alter their behavior? Yeah, I can. And if, in fact, this individual possesses political or charismatic capability, charm, charisma, leadership potential, to then stand before their people and say, this guy's my best buddy now. They might go, well, I'm following this guy. Or they might think he's stark raving mad and I've created social disruption within his political ranks. I can do that on a variety of levels, from individuals who are head of a small family or group, to the tribal, to the community, to the large-scale population. So we can utilize these things to be able to affect key operators and dynamic individuals who may charismatically, politically, or through other means of power be able to affect groups. It's a ripple effect. It is a ripple effect. Moreover, we can induce a number of neuromicrobiological agents to then incur something called high morbidity. These are not necessarily mortal agents. We can modify the existing palette of bacteria and viruses through the use of gene editing techniques, very viable. This has been some of my ongoing work with my colleague, Diane Deulis at National Defense University. And what we can also do is recognize that there are existing microbiologicals that can be harnessed to then induce the effects. We can also engage certain chemicals that way. What we want here is a morbidity factor, not necessarily a mortality factor. I want to make people sick. And what I do here is the virus is not necessarily the bug. The virus is what I put over the internet. Let me show you how I can crash a system pretty easily. I affect key individuals here, here, and here. And then I take another community in the back of the room. I affect key individuals there. And then I take another community. I affect key individuals there. And then I do what every good attributional group does. I beat my chest and take credit for it. And what I put out over the internet is this is a virus, a bacteria, an agent that I have infiltrated into your fill in the blank. I say it's a weapon of mass destruction. And what I tell you it's going to do is it's going to produce paranoia, anxiety, and sleeplessness. What I've just done is I've recruited every paranoid hypochondriac to think that they have whatever that is. I've used salient and sentinel cases, and I create essentially a legion of what's known as the worried well. They now flood emergency rooms. They flood their clinicians. The CDC responds back and says, no, 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 there is no such a thing. And I've created a schism of trust between the population and the polis. It's both a short and a long war's effect. 
Moreover, I can create particular neuromicrobiologicals that may have a much longer duration of action, for example, modified Zika virus. And what I can then do is, as a consequence of that, is I can affect subsequent generations to incur a public health morbidity and mortality effect that then creates an increased economic and perhaps social burden. Long war scenario. If I wanted to do something that's a little bit more proximate, I can utilize nanoparticulate matter. Now, we can utilize nanoscience to create much better drugs to get them where they got to go in the brain. I can create nanoscience and nanotechnology to be able to escort certain drugs across the proliferant barrier, which is the blood-brain barrier and blood uh, cerebrospinal fluid barrier. So I get these things where they got to go. But I can also utilize nanoparticulate matter in a very indiscriminate way. The idea here is that I can get something called high CNS aggregation material that is essentially invisible to the naked eye and even to most scanners because it is so small that it selectively goes through most levels of filter porosity. These are then inhaled either through the nasal mucosa or absorbed through the oral mucosa. They have high CNS affinity. They clump in the brain or in the vasculature, and they create essentially what looks like a hemorrhagic diathesis, in other words, a hemorrhage predisposition or a clot predisposition in the brain. What I've done is I've created a stroking agent. And it's very, very difficult to gain attribution to do that. I can use that on a variety of levels, from the individual to the group, highly disruptive. And in fact, this is one of the things that has been entertained and examined to some extent by my colleagues in NATO and to those who are working on the worst use of neurobiological sciences to create populational disruption. Very, very worried about the potential for these nanoparticulate agents to be CNS aggregating agents to cause neural disruption either as hemorrhagic and vascular disruptors or as actual neural network disruptors because they interfere with the network properties of various neural nodes and systems within the brain. Then I get to the area of devices. And this, in many ways, is going to be less than definitive. The reason for this is this is highly evolving and I think is limited only in certain cases by context of imagination. What are the devices? Well, I have them here for you here. You have neurosensory mobilizing agents. And to some extent, some of these have already been used. Uh, things like high output sensory stimulators that can be administered from unmanned vehicles, drones, insect borne, or uh, larger scale, macro scale vehicles such as tanks, cars, etc. These are sensory mobilizing agents that use high electromagnetic pulse energy that may also utilize high levels of sound, high levels of, of light energy, and they disrupt neurological sensory function. Already being used, now they're being developed with higher specificity. The idea of intracranial pulse stimulators take this one step further. Now the idea is to utilize direct electromagnetic pulses to be able to disrupt neural network aggregation. There have been some animal studies that have been done that look at the viability of electromagnetic pulses across various distances to essentially disrupt the network properties of the brain and create confusional models. So these are both individual and group disruptors. You also have the idea of the altered reality tactics that is primarily used in irregular warfare. And here, once again, when we understand the, the construct of the way neural networks operate, they operate by key controller and influencing nodes that interact with other neural networks within the brain electrochemically. If we can utilize transcranial mechanisms to be able to disrupt this, what we can do is we can create disrupted neural network aggregation and literally disrupt people's sense of time, space, and place. And there have been a number of experiments that have examined this, more in the medical context of looking at how we can try to control epilepsy. And we do recognize that these things are viable, although they have not yet been translated directly into operational use. But they have been entertained for certain forms of special operations in irregular warfare. And so they're on the palette of possibility, although not near-term probability. Yeah. If we go one step further, I think it becomes important for us to also understand that we can utilize devices slightly differently. This is the idea of the sort of non-human cyborg. And I don't use that word in any way colloquially. I mean it literally. A cybernetic organism that is an integration between a biological system and a technological system. The pioneering work in this field was done years ago. It was Delgado's work with deep brain stimulation in a bull. He utilized deep brain stimulating electrode coupled to a remote device, got into the bull arena, induced the bull to charge, pressed the button, and arrested the bull's forward motion. Stopped, poised right before him. See what I can do through the use of cybernetic interactive systems, remotely controlled brain systems, brain interfaces. Could we now utilize that on different scales? 
Well, we're not talking about dropping electrodes into people's heads. Despite what people will say, this is not a large-scale program to infiltrate the population with indwelling electrodes. With all due respect to Elon Musk, I think the actual translation of that into a broad-scale event within the population as it very, very least speaks of the fantasy, if not fictional, and I think in many cases is very, very difficult to translate. Will key individuals get certain implants? Yes, I believe they will. Will key individuals also be able to get the benefits of translational neurosurgery that decrease some of the risks and burdens? Yes, they will. Will this be widely seen as a mechanism of individual and crowd control? No, it will not, at least not in the immediate future. But what has gone from the drawing board to the reality is this the use of neural interfacing and physiological interfacing through the idea of remote controlled small scale systems to be able to modify the behavior of non-human animals on a variety of scales, small mammals and increasingly the use of insects. The pioneering work was done by DARPA, something called the DARPA beetle or the DARPA fly, and more recently an independent non-DARPA funded commercial enterprise calls itself Dragonfly has been able to utilize a combined set of techniques, both direct neural stimulation through the use of what we call macro technology and optogenetic control of key neuron firing patterns to be able to direct the wing beats and pulses and as a consequence directionality of a dragonfly. And characteristically an insect of about that big works quite well because it can not only carry this particular payload which is very, very light and now does not have the burden of the prior DARPA beetle that needed a battery. This utilizes a solar rechargeable source, so it is infinitely powerable, but must also be able to bear the burden of now these very, very small scale, and in some cases, they're looking to the high level nano or, or, or at least low level micro scale use of various electrodes that can then both record and perhaps deliver certain types of payloads as well. So the idea of now going back to these very, very low dose nanopharmaceutical delivery of toxins or other chemicals and utilizing this as a controlled vector becomes a real possibility. Note, this has not been directly addressed nor has it been entertained by any United States government entity in a public forum. This is not what DARPA has intended this device to be. This is supposed to be a surveillance device that could be used for public health and also to monitor key environmental factors, and the same is being touted here, that this is not a device that is weaponizable. The reason I tell you about it is that this was a point of considerable debate and discourse at the recent meeting of the European Union Human Brain Project Subcommittee on Dual Use. And I stood before these people and said to them, you know, this is not being entertained in these ways. And the response there was, yes, but it should. And so the fact that people are thinking about this but this was not explicit intent, means that it is in fact capable to be developed in these directions. And that becomes a real concern and consideration. So when we're looking at this idea of neuroscience and technology for national security, intelligence, and defense, I think the take home message here is that yeah, we can access and affect, manipulating control, so to speak, neural systems to affect, alter, change, direct minds via brains and therefore the hearts in which those minds are embodied. We used to talk, as I said, about hearts and minds. Now, through the use of neuroscience and technology, minds and hearts is a far more viable description because it describes for us explicitly the root of engagement. What we can do here, I think, is very provocative. What we should do, uh, that's still, I think, a point of contention and represents a work in progress. And I think the reason this becomes so contentious is that although we may even be able to leverage particular amounts of regulatory pre- and proscriptional control over large-scale governmental agenda that are dedicated to these efforts, and may even be able to exercise such control onto the commercial interface, a growing problem is the do-it-yourself biological market, what is commonly referred to as the biohacking community. And it's, it's problematic not inherently because of what it is they do. This is, this is public science. as a science taken out into the public forum, utilizing available tools and technologies that indeed allow individuals to create highly valid scientific techniques and technologies in their backyard, in their basement. I think there's a strong push towards public science that in many ways is applaudable. And I'm not impugning the community nor its efforts. What I am doing is I'm putting out a warning. I'm, I'm giving forth sort of the need to take heed and perhaps take action. This is also a very vulnerable community. 
The reason for it is twofold. Number one, that there are individual actors, as with any community, who may have different agenda. And those agenda may not necessarily be, for what we consider to be always benevolent, wanting to do good purposes. Or let's face it, it could be wholly benevolent, but my good is not yours. And as a consequence, the ideology, purpose, and intent of what I seek to do may not necessarily be consistent with what you seek to do. Moreover, the level of financial base that would allow certain distinctions and certain integrities of control and safety may not be present in all of these operations. And as a result, accidental contamination, accidental spill out of one silo into the public silo may be burdensome, risky, or harmful to the public health. And then, of course, there is the relative corruptibility and diversion of that community by key individuals who may be susceptible to venture capitalists or other state or even non-state actors that have very, very discrete agenda, not all of them necessarily benevolent or not all of them aligned with the key interests of here in the United States or some other country. There is a vulnerability profile that I think needs to be made aware. And of course, there has been a response to this and there has been activity in this direction because this community is also dramatically and ongoing dynamically interfacing with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Some of our conferences here at Livermore have been able to engage these partners in, I think, a very, very meaningful dialogue. And I urge, and I urge this in a public forum, that this dialogue should continue, not in a suspicious way, but in a way that protects the individuals who are operating in the do-it-yourself biology community from their relative purloinment and also recognizes that there are potential threats to not only that community, but the community at large, and as a consequence, national security and defense. The reason I tell you that is that this also speaks to the what can be done and what should be done about it. And although I'd love to be able to stand before you now and say, here are the answers one by one, I can't do that. I can't, not in a definitive way. And one of the reasons for that is I think we can certainly talk from our own pulpit and we can only discuss the palette that we have available and which we can manipulate here. Indeed, many of the things that I've spoken to you about with regard to biologicals, chemicals, toxins, they're controlled. But I think that the other issue then becomes twofold. Number one, that signatory treaties do not only guarantee compliance and performance, and number two, not everybody has signed the treaty. And if I go one step further, not everything I've talked about falls under the purview of the existing treaties. Case in point, these biologicals, in some cases, and these technologies and others. Put them all together, I get a much larger grab bag of combinatory approaches that can be used that are not explicitly addressed in the current signatory treaty's language, scope, or purpose. And as a consequence, what this does is it opens the door for possibility. Possibility certainly fosters probability. Moreover, this is being conducted on an international scale. Recent estimates, not speculations, I sound like a broken record, I talked about this this morning, not speculations by the Neurotechnologies Industries Organization has predicted that by 2025, greater than 50% of international neuroscience and technology will be conducted, listen to this, outside the West. Not outside the United States, not outside Europe, outside the West. Now that's an important consideration because what it demonstrates is a shift in the capability potential and ultimate power that can be yielded by this. I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing, it's a thing. But I'm also, I think it becomes important for you to understand is that this also needs consideration because of the fact that not all philosophies are aligned with our own. Moreover, the needs and values of other cultures may not necessarily be the same as ours. And they have every right in the world to be able to engage that cosmopolitan viewpoint. In other words, certain cultures have different philosophies that then acknowledge different needs and different values in distinct ways. And if, in fact, we recognize this, it demands a larger discourse, one that brings together international partners in a cooperative way to be able to both pulse the field and, in some cases, policy the field. And that's critical. Because failure to do anything right now leads an opportunistic space wide open and moreover overt proscriptions in these areas without consideration for that opportunity space can incur certain vulnerabilities. This is not something you want to get caught with your pants down about. Level of proper investment, attention to detail and engagement I think is important. Is this the only weaponizable form of science and technology? No. Is this a huge threat that leverages up there for example with nukes, dirty bombs? No is this certainly, I think, a growing reality and as such a viability for risk and threat? Yes. Does the appropriate level of attention need to be dedicated to it and action then need to be articulated thereupon? Yes, absolutely. Do I have a specific number or percentage of time investment and dollars that in fact should be dedicated to this? No, I don't because I think it too needs to be iterative in keeping scope and pace with the science as it develops. 
on the world stage, as I said, you've seen non-state actors, you've seen do-it-yourself neurotechnologies, and increasingly, what we find is that this is becoming not only, uh, I think, a valid concern, but a viable concern, given the relative facility of neuroscience and technology. We can pull this stuff right off the shelf. Much of it, particularly in the direct-to-consumer space, then becomes available to do it yourself for as well as a variety of state and non-state actors. Moreover, there are dedicated efforts by a number of states that are keenly investing in the neurosciences and neurotechnologies, many with explicit dual-use capability and potential. Third, this is being undertaken not only by nations, but by independent actors are then being venture capital funded, both explicitly and implicitly, by various nations that have keen interest in developing a disrupted or at least directional balance of power in this opportunity space. And as I try to show you in this lecture over these past 40 minutes or so, this can occur in a variety of applications. And the lack of commitment to at least an understanding and good depiction of it on our side can, in many cases, not only not preclude others' initiatives, but in some case, opportunize it. So clearly what we see is that this gives rise to a whole host of neuroethical, legal, and social issues. I'll not bore you with these in detail, but I think we can parse those into those that are focal to the technology, intersection of unknowns, their capabilities and limitations, and runaway effects, not only of the science and technology itself, but runaway effects of individuals who recognize its power and then take this into trajectories that we ordinarily would not assume would be engaged because we may think there are limits and proscriptions. The idea that, well, we won't go there doesn't mean that someone else won't. Furthermore, I think that there are some ethical legal issues that need to be raised, not only with regard to what we're doing with the science, but what can be done with it. The inviolability of mind and self, what we talked about earlier. Could we use these for interrogation? Could we use these in warfare? Yes, we could. Should we? Mm. But we could argue, well, less harm is going to be incurred, but really what are the harms once we get into the relative inviolability of the brain space, the last private domain, if you will? Oh, yes, I know the counter argument says we do that already, and perhaps that's valid. But I think developing that discourse in a very, very realistic way at the level of granularity that's necessary will be important to each and every step forward. Moreover, if in fact what we're looking to do is to be able to gain broad base of information, and be able to pulse that information through relative discrepancies and ultimately transgressions, we then get into arguments about what constitutes privacy, what constitutes protection, what is mitigation, what is manipulation, and then how do we entertain these things on the world stage. And if we're looking to say, well, we understand that perhaps we need to go in this direction, as many have argued, well, what ethics are we going to use? some form of civilian ethics that's operative, for example, for the life sciences and medicine, perhaps, and that may be viable in research, but in translating research to operations, what do we use then? The idea of justification both in and for war, a just war and just conduct under war? Or perhaps we need to explore yet another ethical principle that was also very well ex explicated under the Augustinian maxim, which is the idea of jus contra bellum, which essentially means Justification of use to prevent war. But how far do you go? To what extent? What represents benefit? What represents burden? What represents harm? I don't have answers, but what I can tell you is that this is certainly what we consider to be a science and technological superhighway. It, it's a super speedway. And I like that analogy for a lot of reasons, because it, it's true. There are multiple lanes of entry and multiple lanes of competition. There are a lot of vehicles that are being entertained there. It's a very rapid pace. There are hazards. There are certainly race rules, and though not everybody obeys the race rules, and sometimes if you don't obey the rules, you get ahead of the pack. And of course, there are big prizes. But like any race, you know, the morbidity and mortality going at this speed with this level of integrity, with this level of momentum is real. So to be able to handle the super speedway, one of the things that we've suggested is this, something we've called on-ramp. Get it? Speedway? On-ramp. There you go. It's the operational neurotechnology risk assessment and management process or paradigm. And what it really does is it embraces, I, I think, an, an older idea that had been advocated initially by Zbigniew Brzezinski, essentially in 1970, 1972. I won't bore you with the quote, but you can read it yourself. But essentially the issue here was that the idea that the modification manipulation through biochemical manipulation of the brain was seen as real in 1970 and has now been realized some 40 years later. This is a real speedway. This is not hypothetical. This is a race that was defined, and like so many other races that are defined, it's simply a question of the technological and scientific sophistication of the entries on the race. 
it's real. What it forces us to do is to evaluate the neuroscience and technology with regard to its capabilities and its limits. Don't make anything up. There's plenty there to really be concerned about. This is not a bunch of sit under a tree, navel gazing, and let's make up these hypothetical fictional scenarios. No neuroscience fiction here. Let's utilize neuroscience fact and do this in a capabilized way. Evaluate the real parameters of use. How could these be used? How could they not be used? And as a consequence of that, where do the real risks and threats really lie? What are the benefit, burden, harm parameters of using these or not using these? And ultimately, what are the contexts of application? Intelligence, security, defense, public safety. In some cases, looking at the research side of the house and the operational side of the house. All of these must fit into this quasi-calculus of how we then approach risk assessment and mitigation. There's nothing new about this. This is a simple, tried and true risk assessment and mitigation paradigm that is now being applied to the use of neuroscience and technology in these key domains. What we've tried to do is to dial in the specificity through the use of some key questions. How do we do it? We identify the risk scenarios, try to model them, craft these strategies for preemption and preparation. Preparation is the big step. Strategies that are relevant and durable and identifying the, the plan that's necessary. What do we try to do there is we, we try to develop these contingencies and exigencies. And in developing these things, it's essentially a four-step process. Looking at the technical rectitude, the right ways that one could utilize any neuroscience and technology. And what I mean by the right ways is using the techniques and technologies in correct ways. Using them in ways that are real. Understanding the capabilities and limitations. What are the situational variables that are germane to their use? Could they be used this way or not? Yeah, I could say I want to neuroimage people, left, right, and middle, but am I going to get everybody in the scanner? No, I'm not. So how am I really going to use these things? Evaluation, ultimately a revision of these ethical concepts to guide use and framework for establishing and executing ethical engagement. Very important to do. These last two steps are work in progress. What we've called for in this approach is something called tasker. Groups of individuals can be assembled to look at the problem who are task agile, scientifically knowledgeable, and ethically responsible. Because what we're trying to do is balance the relative goods of neuroscientific and technological advancement with the relative burdens, risks, and harms of potential areas of dual use that could be employed and how those then affect national security and defense. We've called for a series of questions called W framing questions. What can the technology do? When will it be used? Under which circumstances? In whom? And then we frame these in what we call C contingencies. What is the actual capability of the science and technology? How will it affect the character of those upon which it is used? What are the consequences that its various use or non-use will occur? What are the contexts in which it may be employed, not employed? And what are the contingencies that go into that? And ultimately, are there issues of consent or non-consent that need to be defined? Because the thing you don't want to do, and the thing that we're arguing against, is doing this and getting this is unraveling the potential Gordian knot of what the brain is, only to open a can of worms by so doing. It's not a question of not going forward. It's a question of looking at what we call footfall effects. It's not a prohibition or proscription against putting one foot in front of the other, but it's recognizing of where those feet are going to fall and what the consequences are where you put them down. And also recognizing we're not walking alone. Because ultimately, by taking that approach, which is a preparedness approach, what it allows you to do is to remain steady irrespective of your gait or your stance, and do so irrespective of who's pushing and who's pulling. Work in progress. I wanted you to be aware that the work that we're doing in neuroscience and technology can certainly be leveraged and, I think, advanced for good within biomedical and even broadly non-biomedical arenas with regard to public use, lifestyle use, and occupational use. But as with so many other things, this is a double-sided blade that can be leveraged not only for good, but for different definitions of good that in some cases can incur harm. No, 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 this is not cry wolf. Certainly the sky is not falling. But be able to differentiate a puppy from a dog from a wolf, recognize that wolves have teeth, recognize that wolves have claws, recognize that wolves have a pooper on the back end, and all those can get you in trouble. And no, as I said before, sky is not falling, but certainly looks like rain. Bring an umbrella. Because, as I like to say so many times, with neuroscience and neurotechnology comes great knowledge and great capability. And with great capability comes tremendous responsibility. Those of you who are working in the field bear this responsibility. You know, my dad was an engineer. I say this at the end of every, every lecture I give, and I'll say it here unapologetically. 
And one of the things we used to like to do when I was a little kid, our sort of like father-son activity, was to build things and fix things. And I still like to work on airplanes and motorcycles and stuff. And when I was a little kid, my father had this, this thing he used to do. Every month, he'd give me a brand new tool. He was teaching me how to use tools. I got really excited after the first few tools. I thought I knew exactly how to use tools. I was a little kid. What did I know? And I remember once, very, very vividly, he gave me this new tool. I want to run off and use it. He put his hand on my shoulder, and he says, Jim, slow down. Measure twice. Cut once. Sometimes you can't go back. Wow, Dad. Great advice. Neuroscientists, neuroengineers, colleagues, friends, those of you working in national security, intelligence, defense, those of you working on the policy side of the house, let's measure twice. Let's cut once. Because sometimes all of us won't be able to go back. It's a difficult field. If you want to get in touch with me, you know where I live. It's right there. Hold on. Boom, boom, boom. It's right there. If you want more readings in the field, I'll provide these for you. Certainly, this PowerPoint is available to you. This is the part of the lecture that is the unabashed self-promotional <laughs> plug. If you'd like to read more deeply about the uses of neurocognitive sciences in national security, intelligence, and defense, I recommend this. There are other books. Certainly, the reason I give you this is because I'm proud of it, not because I did it, but because it was an effort in bringing together great minds from an international perspective to be able to look at the field and at least illustrate some of the ethical issues, if not solve the ethical questions that go along with it. And once again, I think the thing that we need to understand is that realistically, oops, boom, boom. The future's in our hands here. The brain's at our fingertips. The last thing in the world we want to do with this capability is fumble it. So with that, I'll end my presentation. I'll thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't bore, and there's plenty of time for questions. Thank you very much.